Athena is a writing wonderkin, and June, an unsuccessful author, is filled with jealousy because of her friend's success. When a tragedy leaves one dead, will the other exploit the memory of her companion for her personal gain? The book, Yellow Face by R.F. Huang. And you're listening to Lit Society. Let's get lit! And this is Alexis. And you're listening to Lit Society, a show about books and drama. Alexis, let's slide right on into the context surrounding this week's book, Yellow Face. What can you tell us about the author and perhaps her inspiration for this story? Okay, so I got a inform- I got some information for ya. Okay, R.F. Kwong, <laughs> also known as Rebecca F. Kwong, was born in Quanzhou or Canton, China. And she grew up in Dallas, Texas. She attended Georgetown University. And halfway through college, she wrote her first novel, Poppy War. The book was published when she was 22 um, in, ni- in 2018. And it was received, um, it received Best Book Award from the Washington Post, The Time, and several other publications. Poppy War is part of a trilogy and she would go on to publish three um, additional books by 2022. RF has a master's in philosophy um, from Magdalene College, Cambridge, and a master's in science from the University Oxford um, University College, Oxford. And she's currently pursuing her PhD at Yale University. Mm. Um, the book that we're covering today is actually her fifth novel. First, uh, first piece of literary fiction. Yellow Face was published in May of this year, and it debuted at number five on the New York Times list, bestseller list for hardcover fiction. Um, I found a HarperCollins article that speaks to her inspiration, and this is what it says. She says, I recall it was early 2021 while publishing was still being rocked by the movements of late 2020. The publishing paid me social media campaign had taken off. Folks were sharing and comparing advances. And there was a lot of chatter across the board about how publishers had let down their BIPOC readers and writers. There was a lot of promise of change from the top. But by the time I started drafting in 2021, you could tell there was something in the air that this change was never going to materialize in any meaningful way. What we saw instead were some shallow cosmetic changes, ornamental nods toward diversity, a few token opportunities, a few big BIPOC books of the year. I wanted to write something that spoke to that cyclical cyclical cynicism and the remarkable stability of the system to absorb the shockwave of critique. If anything, the system only turns critique into another way to profit. Oh, I love that. This is from the author? From the author, yep. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Very well put. Mm, Thank you. So that turned into this book we're covering today, and that's our information about the author. Okay, I did also see some information about her background um, and criticism she's received in the past uh, for perhaps not representing her own culture in the way that others see fit or see they believe she should. And Uh we've talked about this before, that when you are writing to your own experience culturally, there are other members of that culture who will not um, agree with maybe your takes on some things. And that's okay. Like, um, so I actually love that because uh, all of us aren't living the same experience, even right. within the same culture. Uh, there is some more criticism of her also, um, but that's easy to find if you're if you're looking for it. And it all pretty much deals with her background, the criticism she's received in the past and the way she's reacted to that criticism, mm. uh, which some may not agree with. But I'll just leave that there. So thank okay. you, Alexis, for telling us about our author. Um, can I ask you, what made you choose this book, Yellow Face, for our show? Well, first off, I I thought the title was interesting, but ultimately I came across it um, while searching for the next book as a um, in my uh, Libby 
profile. Oh, great. <laughs> How about you, Kari? Uh, who do you think would enjoy reading this book? I think if you are interested in this uh, young professionals, not quite coming of age, but finding out who they are, identifying who who uh, identifying themselves, uh, this type of story comes um, early in college or right after college for a lot of writers. I think of Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. Um, And although the theme is different, the voice is very familiar. Um, to those types of stories. But this is actually a book. I've never read anything uh, quite like this before. You know, I love an unreliable narrator and this book definitely <laughs> has that. But other than that, uh, it's very unique in a lot of ways. So thank you for choosing it. Well, can you give us a brief spoiler free synopsis of Yellow Face? June has published a book with little to no success. Her friend Athena Lou has published several books with the success June has often dreamed of. But after a freak accident, June weaves a web of lies that she must keep close to her chest for fear of losing all she's ever wanted. Okay, Alexis, thank you. And why don't we take a quick break before we dive deep into the plot of Yellow Face? How does that Sh- sound? Sounds good to me. back alexis please let's dive deep into the plot of yellow face by rf king you have the floor okay part one friends <laughs> listen our narr- narrator begins by telling us the night she watched athena Lou die they were celebrating her tv deal with netflix the narrator tells us that for the story to make sense we need to know two things about athena one athena has absolutely everything she got a multi uh, deal a multi-book deal straight out of college from a major publishing house and at 27 she's published three novels each one bigger than the last the netflix deal that she got is just another feather in the cap and number two she doesn't have friends she doesn't hang around with writers in her own age group And her Instagram photos don't show her hanging around with anybody else. And she doesn't name drop. She doesn't recommend books. And in all the years our narrator has known her, she's never heard her reference another close friend but her. So our narrator, we get the point right off that she's got some (laughs) insecurities. Wouldn't you Mm -hmm. agree, Kari? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing we know about our narrator is that she's jealous of um, Athena. And we know why. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, that jealousy just comes out in such a, I think, a, such a harsh way because she used um, a lot of uh, harsh speech. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And makes a lot of excuses for sure. Mm-hmm. So our narrator proceeds to tell us how she became friends with Athena. They were on the same floor in freshman year and they were in the same writing classes. They both published short stories in the same literary magazine, moved to the same city. Athena moved because she had a prestigious fellowship at Georgetown. And our narrator moved because her mother's cousin rented her a condo for cheap. So the friendship was because they were always in the same place at the same time. Not for any other reason, it would seem. The first book our narrator wrote um, was Over the Sycamore. It was a coming of age story that she's wanted to tell since her childhood. The book was picked up by a small press um, publisher called Evermore. And she was given like $10,000 advance um, with royalties. And Evermore folded very soon after and before the book went to print. But it was picked up by another um, big five publishing company publishing house and she felt like she had made it but the book didn't do well she only sold two maybe three thousand copies and she was moved to a different editor the editor didn't really have any interest in her novel so they didn't promote it it was just a complete wash and she says everyone tells her that that's just the way it goes with your first novel And that she should just keep trying, you know, hard work and tenacity is what gets you the success. So just keep working at it. 
We're often told that about our podcast. Go ahead. <laughs> On the other hand, Athena's novel, Voice and Echo, got a six figure advance and six months before the debut, she got this sexy photo spread in a widely read publishing magazine. Mm-hmm. And she was called the newest prodigy in AAPI um, storytelling. Uh, she sold her a book foreign rights in 30 different territories and the book hit the top spots of bestseller lists for weeks she won awards so it's clear to us that the difference between june and athena is not just all the opportunity is given to athena her work really receives the praise and june's work is a bit lackluster she thought that ten thousand dollar advance was really something only to learn that Well, Athena got six figures, so you're still poor. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, yes. And and then your supporters, uh, they folded. So now you're stuck with an agent who just inherited you. He don't really believe in you. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard. Yeah. Um, But yeah, maybe you're not that good of a writer. Maybe. So listen, our narrator admits that Athena is a good writer. She's not too jealous to admit that, she says. Okay. Um, but also she says Athena is cool. She's beautiful. She's educated. Um, she's got a cool name. She was born in Hong Kong. She's got a uh cool backstory. She's got a British accent. She's tall and thin. She's beautiful. She's beautiful. Our narrator then proceeds to tell us that because Athena is so unbelievably um cool, she gets everything. It's because of her her look they're always going to yeah, go with not, the best not quite thing. the case but that's the way june sees it yeah yeah so in publishing company she says they pick young cool attractive and diverse um people and they lavish all their money on them <laughs> yeah it has and, nothing and this to is do. actually a narrative in on book talk a lot of authors uh white authors are saying that if you're not diverse your books don't sell now Anybody can just do a little bit of research and know that only a quarter of uh, the funds available go to authors of color and of color just means not white. Yep. <laughs> That's a lot of people with a lot of varying stories. Uh, so the overwhelming majority of uh, marketing support and publishing support still goes to white authors. But there, there that is a conversation a lot of uh, authors are putting out there that it's not that I can't write, it's that I'm not diverse, which yeah. what does that even mean? But go ahead. It's an excuse. It's really an excuse. Ooh. That's what Alexis said. Don't come after me. <laughs> Poor, poorly writing. <laughs> ba- don't come after me, bad writers. That's Alexis talking about y'all. I support bad writers. Okay, don't we? Do we? I guess we no, do, don't we? we? Don't. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, let's meet our uh, narrator. She is June Hayward, and she's described as brown-eyed and brown-haired, a w- woman from Philly. Doesn't say she's a white, but we deduce that she is a white woman. June tells us that no matter how hard she works or how well she writes, she will never be Athena Lou. And while June expects Athena to no longer remain friendly to her as she rises in her success, Athena continues to reach out to her, asking her what she's writing about, sending her messages of good luck. But June um, tells us that their friendship is really only skin deep. They never really, uh, the time they spend together, and though it's quite a bit, it's not meaningful. They're they not don't getting... share ideas. They don't talk about who they are as individuals, yeah. their upbringing, their history. The only information that they know about each other are su- is superficial, and they don't try to make it more than that. They're convenient yeah. companions. Yeah, and June um, believes that Athena only likes her because um, she has nothing to offer and she can't really compete with her. So the night Athena dies, they're having drinks at um, the Graham uh, rooftop bar and June is telling Athena about her publisher ro- uh, woes and Athena attempts to comfort June but every time she does June feels like she's rubbing in her face but that's really uh, June's insecurities eventually Athena begins to tell June about her Netflix 
uh, deal, who she met, how great her working relationship is with her publisher. And June goes on about um, her, um, as she's saying this, June is in her mind talk, talking about her jealousy of Athena. June is ready to go, but Athena invites her. So they've had a couple of drinks. June is like, okay, that's all. That's all my commitment for the evening to this friendship. Um, mm-hmm. But Athena is like, why don't we go up to my apartment and celebrate a little further? We can have some whiskey. Okay. I got a bottle just for the occasion. So they go up to an apartment, but June is like, I want to just see her apartment. I mean, I've never been I'm there. I'm just going to be nosy. Mm-hmm. And June is amazed by the apartment. And while heading to the bathroom in the, and within the apartment, June wanders into Athena's writing palace, which is how she often describes it on social media platforms. And there she peruses the room and sees that Athena uses a vintage typewriter. Okay. And in that typewriter is a page with the words, the end. And next to the typewriter are stacks of pages. And just then Athena walks in and tells June that she has just finished her book um war her world war one project book that she's been working on June then tells uh, us that Athena is famously cagey about her writing projects until they're finished she doesn't talk mm-hmm. to anybody about them she doesn't have beta readers she doesn't um, do any interviews she doesn't share snippets on social media nothing nobody nobody knows about what she's working on until it is complete. The only thing she thinks she's revealed is that the novel has to do with 20th century military history. And it's a big artistic change for her. June congratulates Athena and Athena tells her that no one's read it yet, not even her agent. And June reaches for the first page, but catches herself like, Oop, I'm a little presumptuous here. But Athena gives her permission and she's asking what June thinks of it. And June picks up a pages and realizes how immediately realizes how great the book is. So mm-hmm. she um tells uh she tells us that the writing is tight, but she will not tell that to She tells Athena, Athena you know, I've been drinking, I don't really know what I'm even looking at. And Athena's like, Oh, oh yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> because yeah. actually Athena's all nervous and she's like, Oh, I hope June likes it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And June is being petty anyway. Instead, yeah, she likes the power, the flip. Yeah. She's like, oh, you want me to like your work, huh? Yeah. yeah. After no one likes my work, I won't give you the satisfaction. Yeah. So they just hang out. She's like, like, cool, then let's just hang out. And before you know it, they're sharing stories and having a good time, laughing harder than they've ever laughed together. They've never shared this kind of intimate friendship. She is attributes it to their being having been drunk from all the um celebratory alcohol um she tells us that june tells us that she's always been guarded around athena uh, nervous because she thinks athena will realize that she's not very brilliant and interesting and it's also because of something that happened their freshman year of school and for the first time in their nine years of friendship she doesn't like to, um, she doesn't filter her words to impress Athena. Athena says we should do more of this. Um, why haven't we done it before? And June is like, maybe it was, we were afraid we like each other. <laughs> June doesn't believe this, but she says it. And Athena agrees. And it's like, life is too short. Next thing you know, they're having, um, Athena's making pancakes and they're having a pancake eating contacts contest and whose idea was it to make pancakes athena's it was yeah that's yeah. true and so they're or, having or was a... athena like or, like we should eat something are you hungry and then june says pancakes i think i don't know i'm not sure about that let's put a pin in it Go yeah right do because i don't know why it's important so let's hear about it later okay then um so they have this pancake eating contest, right? And before you know it, June is on seven and Athena is choking. June attempts the Heimlich maneuver, but it doesn't work. So she calls 911, but she doesn't know Athena's address. And she eventually works it out. 
as Athena continues to choke. And when she finally gets the address or location that the medical services, the emergency services can use, Athena dies from choking on a pancake at 27. Now, listeners, you might know that Alexis once tried this with me <laughs> with some catfish. And I had to Do go to the know? hospital Do not they? once, not twice, but three times Yikes. until it was surgically removed from my throat. Who went to the hospital with me? Not Alexis. <laughs> she was already in there having a good old time and I nearly died. So this is interesting. That's the true story, by the way. That only happened a couple of years ago. So, uh, but going back to the book, this yes. is interesting mm-hmm. because June is in shock, of course. Yeah. That Athena, after having so much life that night and in her life, um, just being so full of spirit is now dead. It happened, June says, just like she had read about a girl on campus choking on um, pancake batter or on pancakes, which turned into like almost concrete in her throat. Mm-hmm. And for June to say she read about this exact situation before, y'all, June done killed Athena. Now, I did some <laughs> research and I said, is anyone else picking up on this? And no, no one. So maybe I'm wrong, but I really strongly feel like June maneuvered the situation knowing it was possible for Athena to die. Okay. Who says let's have a pancake eating contest? No one. After a fifth of whiskey? What's wrong with you? Well, you're hungry, so you want to eat. And why Girl, not pancakes? June, There's June light dun, and air. June done done indeed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because what does she do next, Alexis? Uh, after the pancake? Oh, let's get into it. Part two, the edits. Mm-hmm. The police questioned June. And during this questioning, um, it makes her come to the defense she's like but i didn't kill her it was an accident yes she She died because she choked not not because i killed her so in her mind she's you know reasoning out the um uh a defense for herself and it's like but in reality i didn't do anything she died on her own when june arrives home traumatized by Athena's death and that she is she tells us she took Athena's manuscript so I can see where Kari's coming from but no no. yeah she saw that manuscript she read the first few pages and she was like this story is brilliant Athena's gotta die (laughs) I'm in this apartment don't ain't nobody here but us I'm taking the manuscript. One of us is leaving a lot. So she's an opportunist then. And a murderer. Okay. Um, Because she was the last to see Athena alive, she finds herself in social media spotlight. So she posts on her platforms her sorrow over seeing Athena, Athena die. She receives support and sympathy from fans and writing colleagues. And June likes the attention that comes from seeing her follower count rise. Athena's mother asked her to speak at the funeral. And while in her head, acknowledging that she doesn't feel anything about Athena's death, she makes sure she takes time off from work and Twitter. Mm -hmm. The weeks following Athena's death, June decides Athena's book is not really a first draft, but more like an amalgamation of startlingly beautiful sentences and bluntly stated themes. So she decides to take a stab at finishing it. And she considers it really as just some a writing exercise for herself. But quickly she finds herself not stopping. <laughs> and she finds phrases that she feels like better suits um Athena's text, she cuts, she draws out the plot, she trims, she decorates, she adds flowers. She removes some of the more painful moments that depict white soldiers in a bad light because that's not even relatable. Yeah. She wants to make the book more relatable. Yeah. And she says, June says she makes the text sing. 
June tells us she didn't have a plan to profit off of her friend's death, but it just felt so natural and really divine to do it. It felt like the most obvious thing to do to finish and polish Athena's story and, you know, as a nod to her, get it published. Yeah, with um June's name on it. But yeah. Elise is done at least it's published. Yeah. It's what it's what Athena would have wanted. It's what Athena would have wanted. She completes the first draft in three weeks and she writes her literary agent. Okay. <laughs> His name is Brett. And knowing that no one else knows about Athena's draft, she doesn't even tell her literary agent that it's Athena's draft. She passes it off as her own, saying that she's found a new voice, and she asks for his thoughts. June sees this as a way to honor Athena by having her book see the light of day, because if she didn't do it, who would? Mm -hmm. Brett finally responds, um, responds over a week later. He tells her it's a bit different from her range, but he sees the opportunity. He gives her a few editorial suggestions and tells her he'll handle putting it out to a wider audience. Um, she easily makes the edit Brad suggests, and she thinks it's because it's someone else's words. Brad sends her manuscript to senior decision makers at Powerhouse Publishers, and it goes to auctions and discussions are being had. Um, that never came up with her debut novel. <laughs> the Last Front sells to a mid-sized indie publisher known for cranking out award-winning prestigious fiction for more money than she's dreamed of. The deal yeah, is so announced. The truth should be slapping June in the face um, that it's not her like her previous works were just being overlooked. They weren't as good as Athena's works. And now that she has this stolen manuscript from Athena, which she's edited, it's such a great story that everyone believing it's June's works are hopping on it. They all want to be a part of this project. Listen, the deal is now in, announced in Publishers Weekly and she continues to get opportunities for more money. She quits her job and she brags to her family, even though her family doesn't want her to be a writer. They don't really care. She tells her a few writing friends that she catches up with a couple of times a year. The publisher makes an announcement. Her Twitter account grows and June knows that she is living Athena's life. Part three, packaging the lie. <laughs> now the book is sold. June begins to justify her actions more and more in the book by saying <laughs> she rewrote most of the book. But at the same time, she'll say things like, uh, those are Athena's words. It's so weird. <laughs> saying Athena's early drafts were chaotic um, and half finished sentences all over the place. She even... Um, touts it as some kind of never before seen uh, literary collaboration. Also, so what if she stole it? Athena died before anyone knew it existed. After all, the work she put in, why not take the claim? Why not? Plus, she thanked Athena in the acknowledgments. That's got to count for something, right? She's a treasured friend, her greatest inspiration. She even convinces herself that Athena would have wanted it this way. She mentioned how Athena would have loved a trippy, a trippy literary hoax such as this. Sure. <laughs> okay. So have you talked about what the book is about yet? Are you going to dive into that? No, but share with us. Tell us what the last, <laughs> uh, what is it called? The last, good grief. The front? last front. Tell us what the last front is about, Kari. You guys, this is about um, Chinese soldiers in World War One. It's telling the story about a group who many people don't even know existed. Athena had to go through archives. She told experiences from her own family. She did her research over a long period of time to bring these stories to light. And so for June to step in, someone who's never dealt with this type of text before, and to just have picked Chinese soldiers as the subject of the story is so odd, but everyone's fine with it. 
it, it, but this is a huge part that's like hmm and then are you going to talk about her name june's name yeah we'll get to that oh, okay okay oh listen <laughs> she <laughs> so here's one of her bits of reasoning people come to a text with so many prejudices formed by what they think they know about the author I sometimes wonder how my work would be received if I pretended to be a man or a white woman. This is something she says, um, Athena has said before. The text could be exactly the same, but one might be a critical bomb and the other a resounding success. Why is that? Now, this is um, actually Athena's words, but June is thinking about this and like, yeah, well, let's make this is fine. I could do this again. Justification of why she can continue on with this ruse. Um, bottom line, June felt like taking Athena's manuscripts were reparations, um, payback for the things that Athena has taken from her. She said, I'm gonna just say it reparations. <laughs> 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 so it takes it's like a 15 month period before the book is actually published so during this time she gets a new editor that guides her through the writing process june does whatever daniela wants because she wants to make her happy she wants to please her editor june also sees this as an opportunity to lay the groundwork for never ever revealing that athena wrote the book <laughs> Um, and she edited it. Some of um, uh, Daniela's favorite passages, June tells us, are lines that June herself wrote. Okay, so part of laying this uh, groundwork in interviews, June always mentions Athena's name. And June's uh, grief becomes like the cornerstone of her origin story. She even exaggerates their um their friendship Friendship, because they Mm -hmm. weren't really friends yeah (laughs) although they spent time together they were just again as i mentioned earlier there was no depth in the relationship um she makes she even makes a post um of one of the two self selfies she has with her and athena and the caption is a tribute to athena and how they read each other's work and traded ideas and she even says that athena helped her with the research on the book June even sets up a scholarship fund in Athena's name with an Asian uh, organization. Um, While June is laying the foundation of deceit, she comes across a headline that Athena's mom is donating her draft, her draft notes to Yale. And June has to make a plan to intercept this. Jude is like, this cannot happen because what Athena would do is write down everything in moleskin notebooks. And then when she felt like she was ready, transfer those words into her typewriter. So those moleskin notebooks have everything. Anyone can pick this up and be like, now, why is Athena doing all this research for June's book? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mm. She would be plum found out if that gets out, if those uh, notes get out. So she Not goes to. Found out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So she goes to Athena's mom's house and she convinces her that Athena would have n- would not have wanted her books to be donated or presented to the world they're too private Mm -hmm. how come you don't know that and the mom is like oh my goodness you're absolutely right and besides this june talking it might be some personal family stuff in there that she drew from to write her stories you know so and that and then the mom is like oh oh (laughs) indeed that touches the mom because the mom is like her stories the first book i read of hers they were just so closely connected to our life that I just, I can't read them. I just don't want to. And so Mm -hmm. she convinces not only her her mom not to read the stories, but for her not to send them off to Yale. So now. It wasn't even that hard. (laughs) (laughs) Um, There's a point when the mom is like, do you want to take this? Yeah. (laughs) And then June is like, let me not get greedy because <laughs> there's so many potential novels in there. Um, but no, 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 no I won't no. take them. No. And then she didn't want that to get it to be a headline that she yeah, now oh, has right, her right. Um, has her notes. So that wouldn't be a good look. So when June now meets with the marketing team, like they're ready to position this book so that it's, um, you know, ready to sell. 
Um, but since she's not Chinese, and as Kari said, the book is talking about Chinese history. Okay, a uh, people that uh, lots of folks didn't even know existed. Yeah, people didn't know Chinese um, served in World War One. Uh huh. How did you know? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so anyway, there um, there's been blog talk, and so the marketing team is like, "Look, you're not Chinese. We need to set this up right." There's talk about cultural authenticity and people um, writing for a voice that's not their own. June gets a little the current climate, you know, people be tripping or whatever. Yeah. And June <laughs> gets a little defensive and insists that she has done all the research and the work and it shouldn't be a problem. Who puts the book out? Okay. That, that shouldn't be an issue. It doesn't matter that I am a white heat woman. Okay. <laughs> I have done the work. And anyone who says differently is a racist. Exactly. She's going there. So the decision is made um, to use some of the details of June's history of her past. Like she traveled a lot when she was young. As a dog. To like the dog Connecticut. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> she traveled a lot. So they make her a worldly. <laughs> you know, she's well traveled. She's worldly, uh-huh. if you will. Yeah. Not that she's, she's ever been, been to Disney World and Disneyland. So Epcot Center. OK, <laughs> okay. she was all up oh, in Epcot. that. She's been all around the world. Yeah, <laughs> she's been. There. Except she hasn't been to any Asian countries. OK, that's just the thing. Mm. Um. So that's how they try to position her. Get and this would give her some ambiguity. And so they also decide that they need to um uh, work with another piece of uh June's past, and that is that her mom made her middle name song because um, you know, she, she loved hippie. the 80s. But they was like, We like song. That so let's call Asian-ish. her Juniper song. Her name is Juniper. But now she's Juniper's song. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she is officially rebranded. She even goes on to take she some is Asian photos. Now. <laughs> yeah, she even at least on paper, no one can say differently. Exactly. <laughs> and then she goes on to take some um, pictures. Uh, and she like pays. She says she paid. Uh, did she say paid twenty five thousand? Anyway, Ooh. she paid to get these pictures done. All right, and these pictures are so great. She looks ambiguous. They don't know. She a little tan in there. They think she she could be Asian. She could be something. <laughs> we don't know. She got all yeah, of what she needs. She's got that beautiful porcelain skin and those deep storied eyes. <laughs> <laughs> the publishing world is terrible. <laughs> well, they set her up, okay? They have provided the look that needs to be provided to make sure that this book will sell. So people will assume that she has Asian heritage. But June herself has never lied. She hasn't told a story about this. Everything she says is factual. Okay. Then she meets with an editorial assistant or there's an email exchange about, from an editorial assistant named Candace Lee. And she insists there's a need for a sensitivity read. Kari, what's a sensitivity read? That's when you, um, in your book, it doesn't have to be about a culture outside of your own, but perhaps there are characters that come from a culture outside of your home. And uh, this way you have someone from that culture read it, usually a group. So maybe three or four uh, readers will take a look at it for sensitivity issues. Like, did you represent this character in the best light? If there's anything that gives them pause, they say so and why. And this helps to weed out stereotypical characters that are written incorrectly in fiction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And June's like, I don't need that. She's like, <laughs> again, she This falls. is an Asian story. She okay? falls and on the herself, research. To herself, June is like, some stuff Athena got wrong. Mm-hmm. And I felt like some stuff Athena said was racist <laughs> to Asian. So I fixed it. (laughs) So she falls back on her research and the corrections, the edits she's made to this uh, book. And she's like, there is no reason in the world that I need a sensitivity read. Not at all. 
They're not saying change anything. They just say have someone else look at it from the standard. culture because you are a white woman <laughs> mm-hmm. and you have written about Chinese soldiers, their families and their lives. Yeah. Let's just go ahead and have someone. I don't know who's Chinese. Look at it. So then and June <laughs> is offended. It's so offended. And so on top of that, they're like June, of course, is saying no to that. And then someone else chimes in and says, well, why don't you read it, Candace? Candace is like, I'm Korean. So I don't know what I have Ooh. to do with that. Ooh. So uh, this experience hit home. I, I know a situation like this. Do you they really? Was like, have so-and-so read this. And so-and-so was like, I don't speak Chinese. I speak Hmm. <laughs> okay. This happens. <laughs> yeah, it happens. These these mm-hmm. these are not far from truth. Um, so but Candace doesn't let up. She continues to insist. Um, and June decides decides to reach out to her editor for the last front and tell on Candace. So Danielle She's like, have this Candace girl back off. Now Candace has at no point been unprofessional. Candace just believes strongly that this will help the integrity of such an important work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So she's not backing off because um, she's making a point and she wants the others to at least consider it. Yep. The first time she makes the point, they're like, nah, the author's definitely like, no. The second time everyone's like, well, no. (laughs) And then I think like the third time, um, June gets her editor involved to like fight for her. Yeah. And so, um, and the fight is against the idea <laughs> of people from the culture reading the work first. <laughs> Does this that seem like something chosen. she should be uh, standing on, you know, dying on a hill mm-hmm. for? No, girl, no. Even within the culture, you might have a sensitivity read. Mm-hmm. Like maybe you're talking about black Americans from the South and you just want to make sure since you're not from the South and your family isn't that you touch on the right points and you're not stereotyping these people. That's so normal. Yeah. Especially nowadays. Go and get canceled if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, the book is being sent to important people to read and the reviews are starting to come out, come in and they're positive. And then. June goes to Goodreads. <laughs> she sees a one star review. And guess who it's from? Who, Kari? Candace. <laughs> now, this is unprofessional. Shame on you, Candace. Listen, June <laughs> got to tell on her. So she does. She tells Daniela. And Daniela makes it clear that um, she will be talking to uh, Candace. Okay. Yeah, she's going to remove her from the project, basically. But Daniela is like this close to being a part of, uh, <laughs> what's the word? Um, everyone who is on June's side at this point is also, we know enough about them to think they might be a little racist. <laughs> <laughs> like they're, they, they often pick up the ire of the general population on social media for doing things that seem insensitive to different communities. Mm -hmm. And that includes Daniela. That's her name, Daniela? Yeah, Daniela. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so part four, released. When The Last Front is finally released, it gets great reviews. It hits the New York Times bestseller list. It stays there for weeks. And then the critical reviews come. Um, The very things that June is proud of editing out of the original book are being criticized online. The novel is perceived as racist. June is considered a villain. They don't like how she depicts the white versus the Chinese characters. And um, then they focus on June's identity and the cultural inconsistencies in the novel. That makes sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. you know how and you're right this is a historical fiction Mm -hmm. because she adds a a white female character a white woman in it and all the men are just um spellbound by the white woman's beauty and it doesn't have to be in there it's definitely made up Mm -hmm. uh but she just thought it added a bit of uh romance (laughs) 
to the story about World War One. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which you need, you need. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. So you know how um, Beyonce ignores everything on social media. Yeah, well, I don't think she June does. She didn't just don't tell do y'all that. She read. <laughs> and that's the point. That's the point. We all but she perceive didn't it. Always. So when you get to the point where you can do that, you do that. But in the beginning, it's so normal to be a Cardi B, if you will. Listen. And to be just popping off of people's social media. It's petty. It's sad. But people do it. Listen. June didn't do <laughs> You might do have that. to sue a blogger. You don't know. <laughs> she formulates responses to her haters. Okay. And then she drops her mics and walk off and walks off. Okay. <laughs> June doesn't like the criticism, but thinks about um, Athena and starts to rag on her. I mean, she just really be hating on Athena in death. Okay. <laughs> she thinks about how Athena was exploited. Some folks still be messing with you when they not around. <laughs> just their memory. But she's dead. Okay. Oh, no. And she remembers oh. how they went to the museum on the Korean, uh, the museum one time and there was an exhibit for the Korean War and it Athena interviews somebody and then published a short story. And June says she used his exact words. So June decides that if Athena can exploit, then so can she. Okay. And by exploitation, now this is a fine line. She is saying, first of all, that they went to this museum and June thought it was a joke. Like, why in the world do I care about these Asian people? This is what she's thinking as she's going to meet right. Athena. <laughs> So, of course, Athena cares about the exhibit and speaks to a man that's there, gets his firsthand account, and yes, does publish a story based on his words. Yeah, without his permission. That's stealing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. So the criticisms <laughs> begin to increase, okay? Somebody has now created a Twitter account called Athena Lose Ghosts and accuses June of stealing the last front. Okay, the Twitter world is a buzz, okay? And she is getting towed down and a little bit picked up and towed down and a little bit picked up because people are supporting her. They're taking sides on this, right? So June decides, listen, I'm going to figure out who that culprit is. So she enlists her in-laws and she sets up a fake page to figure out who does it. Folks, this book came out in May. I am not going to tell you who that is. I'm not going to spoil that portion. You can find out when you read the book. She does um, confront this person. Moving on. She <laughs> then has an opportunity to attend a literary festival, and she's on a panel where she is the only white person, and one of the panelists criticized her on the panel and accuse her of stealing Athena's work. Now, this make her feel like all kind of something. And she decides from then on out that she's not going to be attending no more of this stuff, okay, unless she's getting some money, an honorarium. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we're moving on. Part this is so outrageously believable. <laughs> Bye. Another book. The book's been out a year by now, right? It's, you uh -huh. know... A lot of stuff has been done and said. Now her agent is looking for another book. You know, it's, you done did this really great book. People want a sequel. We've seen the sequels, okay? We expect something good. Juno had no ideas. And then she tells us she, she stole like, something else. Alone. Why y'all want me to write? This is your life <laughs> job, right? <sighs> she stole another piece of Athena's work. <laughs> And real lazily, like, this had been through some proofreading sessions. People know about this work. <laughs> but she don't care. She stole it. <laughs> she uses it to write her second novel. And she doesn't mm -hmm. do the research. So she doesn't know what Kari said, which is that it's been through some sessions people know. So as soon as she publishes the book, People catch it immediately. They even posting copies of the original work. Yeah, side by side. Like, these lines are exactly the same. June has to come clean with her publisher, but they don't drop her. June continues to justify her actions, and she tells us that um, a time ab about when Athena took her story. Again, I'm not going to reveal this, okay? I'm not going to reveal well, this Well, can story. we just touch it on a, a little bit? So there was a time in college 
where um, June went through something, told Athena, and it ended up in one of Athena's stories. And June felt so violated. But it's interesting because when June is relaying this, she says, this is a story that a lot of college girls have. So my thing is, June, she's such a double why did talker. you just assume Athena didn't have a similar story? She's such a double she's like, talker. No, a lot of girls have this, but Athena stole it from me. Yeah, she's such a double talker. And so she still. She uses her words. Okay. In any event. Mm-hmm. Um, so her literary friends start ignoring her because now it's like proving a pudding. She has stolen some work. And her agent is now asking her to like take on some IP work um, if she needs yeah, some IP help work coming is up. what we're all sick hold of. On, hold 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 on. Now you just, mm-hmm. I know you're excited about this book, but slow down. Her agent is now asking her to take on some IP work and she needs help com- because she needs help coming up with her own concept, obviously. Kari, what is IP work? Tell the readers. IP IP stands for intellectual property. And really, any story that you create out of thin air, that story is your intellectual property. You own the rights to it. Um, However, IP work usually means uh, perhaps developing a new layer in a Marvel universe, something (laughs) that someone else owns and you're just adding to it legally. Um, sometimes that's great. We love a new uh, dimension in the universe. Or we did till they started beating us <laughs> over the head. Now we're just sick of superheroes. But um, that is what IP work is. So th- the agent is like, why don't you take some IP that's already out there and see if you can work with it? That's Which so- is really what she been doing, just uh, not exactly, legally. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> she love IP work. <laughs> ah! And she don't even know that. She has the audacity <laughs> to scoff at this offer. Talking about she got some standards. Do you though? Yeah. Do you? <laughs> Listen, June continues to get beat up on social media and she starts to feel sorry for herself saying, it matters what audiences want to see and no one cares about the inner musings of a plain straight white girl from Philly. They want the new and exotic, the diverse and if I want to stay afloat, that's what I have to give them. June now decides she got an idea. She's going to write about the scandal associated with the last run. The story of stealing Athena's work and she'll weave fact with fiction. And she's going to get to work. So she's got an idea finally of her own. But again, it's she's stealing. <laughs> So I'm ready to wrap it up. Can I mention one thing? What is it, though? (laughs) So it's interesting that June's mother is very uninterested in June's work. Even when the success of The Last Front pops off, the mother is not really taking an interest at all. Um, June goes and sits with her mother and is like, you know, how come you never supported me? And her mom is like, of course I support you. Um, but don't you think it's time that you get a job, you know, get a job you'll be good at. Yeah. And we and we get in this moment an idea that June's mother just doesn't think she's a good writer. <laughs> <laughs> she totally supports her uh, as much as she can. But she's like, you got to find something you good. At. So that's that's a case where so people that interesting. like really your family is telling you you're not good, but you push on anyway and you show up on America's Got Talent or some of these other shows and you start singing and now the world got to tell you you can't sing. Yeah, it's hard. But that is how it should be. Everybody should support you blindly. And then strangers should tell you the truth. That's not true. No, (laughs) no. Listen. I don't know. That's how my life been going. The love has to come from within, okay? Within your circle. Otherwise, you're out there looking like a fool. And your friends it's a lot shouldn't of people who that. can't sing that are professional singers. It's a lot of people that can't write that are professional authors. How come those people can't be you? So listen, you can do that if you want to, but as long as you have heard the voices of your inner circle. <laughs> as long as you know you're not good at what you're doing. Okay. Stand in it. Okay. You can stand <laughs> in something real proudly when you know. Okay. <laughs> do your best. I mean, you know the J.J. Fish guy? He's standing his stuff. J.J. Fish, back in the day, some years ago, he was all over social media 
He cannot sing, but he believes he can sing. <laughs> he has a following that believes he can sing, but he cannot <laughs> sing, okay? And he made a whole video. He did all the things. <laughs> and people look, watch the video and literally laugh at them. It's for entertainment purposes. Oh, I love it. Anyway, I it's a thing. Him. It's a thing. And he's His catfish in it. be on point sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it JJ? Yeah, it's JJ Fish. Anyway, readers, if you know about him, let us know. Listen, this is the final part. Oh. June starts to see posts from Athena's old Instagram page. And they are literally taunting her. She is the only one that can see them. It's just her and the poster. Just them. And they are digging at June. Digging at June. They know what she did. And June is on the edge of her seat. And she starts to become paranoid until she forces a showdown with whoever is behind Athena's old page. And I got to end it there. I cannot go further. I just cannot. It's too much in this book to reveal. So let's take a break. Unless, Kari, you think it's something that's important to help the... No, no, I'm ready for a break. Let's do let's it. Let's take it. Alexis, thank you for that deep dive into yellow face. You did a brilliant job. I like the points you hit and I like where you left us off because it is a new book. We didn't want to spoil it. Uh, great job. Now let's move on to our theme of the week. And listeners, if you're a longtime listener or a new listener of our show, you know that each week we, we discuss a theme inspired by the book. This week, the theme is should writers tell the stories of cultures outside their own? Alexis, what do you think? Can a writer talk about someone else's culture or have characters based in cultures outside of their own? So the book that comes to mind when I think of this scenario is um, Mama Ramat's way, the ladies detective agency story. And um, I'm comfortable with that story being told. He is obviously a white man talking about an African woman. And um, I guess it depends on the path the story takes. But the story that he's telling, I think, is lighthearted and fun and is okay to tell. So I, I, I got to say it depends on the, the book, the topic. Thank you for that honest opinion. I think it's interesting, too, that by uh, reading and supporting certain, certain, supporting certain works, we're saying it's okay with us, but we may not be a part of that culture. Right. Like in the case you mentioned, we're not a part of that culture. Mm -hmm. So it's really not for us to say if it's okay. We can say we're okay with it's, it as you did, exactly. but not necessarily that it's okay for the author to be writing about these characters. Um, there's a quote here by Lionel Shriver, uh, author. Uh, they declared in the New York Times in 2016, if we have permission to write only about our own personal experience, there is no fiction, but only memoir, end quote. Um, it's interesting because when the subject comes up, people get really hyperbolic and they're like, what? No one can write. It's like acting. It's like you can only act roles that are part of your for, for characters that are from your culture, yeah. but you're an actor. OK. Let's all calm down just a little bit. <laughs> um, the, there's a quote here from Vox, from Constance Grady, a, a columnist at Vox, and they say something interesting. They say the most prominent voices in this debate have tended to say that, the, that it's entirely possible to write about a particular group without belonging to it. You just have to do it well. Mm -hmm. And part of doing it well involves treating your characters as human beings and not luxuriating in and fetishizing their trauma. So what's the problem when art relies on stereotypes and the mainstream mentality? Um, something that comes to mind is the way uh, we as a uh, culture, and I don't mean black Americans, I mean just the Americans, how we view and actually the world, how the world views a southern black drawl or accent. A lot of what people think that accent is, is actually what Hollywood created for certain movies. Um, sometimes an actor would read the role and the director would say, no, talk more like this. Oh, I you remember know, that. that's mm -hmm. how they talk down there. 
That's not necessarily true, but they wanted to get that stereotype across because that was something easily digestible for the mainstream. So then you're kind of rewriting history. Now people actually believe that's how history was. Mm -hmm. Well, let's bring up uh, examples that we can really bite into. (laughs) Uh, One that comes to mind is Memoirs of a Geisha by Arthur Golden. Now, Arthur Golden is a Tennessee-born writer educated at Harvard in art history. He specialized in Japanese art. Uh, He obtained an MA in Japanese history and has visited and lived in Japan and China. His family is also um, like, um, he's also a member of the family that protects and writes for the New York Times. So it's only so much we're going to say about Arthur, but let's keep it (laughs) cute. Listen, his work on Memoirs of a Geisha was scrutinized following the book's translation into Japanese. Mm. Uh, so Japanese people got and it was like, mm, some in the milk ain't clean. This don't make any sense. Mm-hmm. In fact, one woman whose account served as one of the main resources for this book sued Golden for defamation. Mm. And he promised he wouldn't reveal any, name, reveal any names or secrets, but he did anyway. Nope. He hasn't published a novel since Memoirs of a Geisha. Oh. And that book was hugely, a huge commercial success uh-huh. with a movie Whatever deal. Um, a movie a lot of people know and love. Mm-hmm. Um, but how that story was handled, some don't feel it was handled with respect or honesty. Mm. Okay. Another one that many of us are familiar with, American Dirt yep. by Janine Cummins. Uh, It received glowing reviews and even blurbs by Stephen King, Josh, John Grisham. Uh, And this was before like the um, the later reviews came in and more eyes uh, were were on the novel. The New York Times had reviews it had reviewed it twice, once in the daily paper and once in the book review, their weekly book review, in addition to interviewing the author and publishing an excerpt from the novel. But as the publication date approached, the the narrative around American Dirt was changing. All these negative reviews centered on one major problem. Do you remember what that was? Uh, I think she made up some stuff in her interviews with the people. Oh, about herself. So uh, Janine Cummins is a white woman. Okay, that's how she identifies. But she started calling attention to, I think, a great great grandmother that's Puerto Rican um, or some other things. And it wasn't clear when the interviews began that she was uh, of the white race. It, it wasn't clear. <laughs> she didn't make it clear. She did a so June people, number. Some on people. Them. Some people did believe that she was a person of color, but even more than that, uh, a lot of people felt that the way the book depicted Mexican migrants uh, was it didn't make them human. Mm. It allowed the user to pick up that pain, any pain in the book and put it down. Um, And some people thought some people in the industry thought that Cummins um, fetishized the pain of the characters instead of treating them like people. She repackaged them for colorblind consumption. And that's what we see a lot in Yellow Face. Well, this part, it's too harsh. It won't feel true, even though it might be based in truth. Let me rewrite it for colorblind consumption. Um, in promotion of the book, the publisher hosted a dinner with barbed wire centerpieces. And this just goes <laughs> to the uh, inhumane, detached way the subject um, was treated. Another book is The Help by Catherine Stockett. It centers white women in a story about black women in the 60s. And part of it's been called um, impossibly untrue or stolen from actual people's lives, which mm. is, you know, that keeps coming mm-hmm. up. It's also been accused of playing into the white savior narrative, a trope where white characters come to the rescue of minorities in a feel good tale that dilutes people of color in their own stories by minimizing and simplifying racial issues. Um For this book, though, I thought a very apropos author is Lisa C. Lisa has written a library about Asian characters and Asian stories. Her paternal great grandfather is Fong C, Chinese, making her one eighth Chinese. From this history, she has pulled a (laughs) bagajillion stories. And some people have a problem with that. Again, 
is it because her stories are, uh, her characters are multidimensional and um, the, the, the fiction in them can be perceived as truth, almost um, changing the way some people see Chinese people <laughs> based on this story by a white woman? You know, there's, there's something there. So in the end, neither of us can say whether someone can write characters from outside of their cultures. But what anyone can say as readers, uh, we can say, is that when that's done, it has to be done in a sensitive way because we cannot ignore our own personal bias, right? right? We have had experiences and we've been told things, some things we accept to be true and we don't even know why. And some of those things may not be true. When we pour those untruths into characters, we can cause real life harm to people. People can read books and not get a, a job to someone else. People can read books and choose to move out of a neighborhood. This actually happens every single day. We are all influenced by the world around us. So do not ignore personal bias. And can someone write about a character outside of their culture? Maybe. Yeah. So... That's that on that. Okay, Kari. Well, thank you for sharing your theme of the week. Are you no ready to um, give us your final verdict and whether or not you'll recommend this book? Uh, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed Yellow Face. Uh, I felt like it was such an interesting POV. Um, and even though the author probably poured a, a little of herself in Athena and tried to change or tried to influence reviewers and readers view of you know the author through that character I still enjoyed it having not known anything about the author when I read it I felt like it was just so interesting to see a character lack self-awareness and still somewhere in the back of her mind be very aware and to make decisions for her own personal gain while feigning ignorance it's so real <laughs> <laughs> we see it every day Hashtag so would life. I recommend this book yes <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. In real life. Would I recommend it? Yes. Did I enjoy, enjoy it thoroughly? I could not put it down. What about you, Alexis? Did you like Yellow Face? And would you recommend this book? I did like Yellow Face. Um, there is harsh language in it. And for that, I can't really recommend it. But I did enjoy the story. Um, I followed it whole way through. This woman is so delusional. It's uh, It's really <laughs> great. So there you have it. Well, what are we reading next week, Alexis? Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America by Marsha Chatlin. That's right. That's a nonfiction. Thank you all for listening to Lit Society. We'll see you next Thursday. Lit Society is brought to you by Alexis Honoria and Kari Herrera. Support the cause by leaving a five-star review for our show on Apple Podcasts, along with a comment about why you absolutely love we us. Love we you love y'all, too. If you've enjoyed what you've just heard, tell a friend about Lit Society. Visit LitSocietyPod.com for show notes, this month's book list, and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter. And until next time, you guys, read, read something. something.